Today, we're living in an age of political pessimism, but Labour would be very well advised not to spend 2024 talking Britain down. First of all, Happy New Year. My initial 2024 New Statesman piece is about the year ahead, but trying to look below the surface uh, of what will be an incredibly important electoral year. Above the surface, it's fairly clear what's going to happen. The Prime Minister said there will be an election this year, not next, not 2025. So we think probably November. It might be earlier, it might be a spring election, but probably November. My working assumption is we'll have a general election in the second half of this year. And we know the overall surrounding circumstances, if you like. We know that inflation is falling and that interest rates will follow. Uh, We know that what was looking like a migration-based election is starting to feel more like an election based around the economy, very traditional uh, position for the Conservatives to be in. And we know that Rishi Sunak, having positioned himself as the change candidate, the real break from the old Conservative years, is now reverting to type and campaigning much more as a traditional Conservative leader. All those things are fairly obvious. And if we look beyond the horizon, way beyond the British political scene, we know that the single biggest problem and shadow ahead is the likelihood of Donald Trump being re-elected as President of the United States again in November. But I wanted to look instead, as I say, below the surface at some of the undercurrents that we don't talk about perhaps enough. And the first thing I want to say is that I think it'd be a mistake for the opposition to bet too heavily on the downside of the British economy, to be too bearish about 2024. We've had a series of economic predictions which have been proved wrong recently. The British economy has done much better than the Bank of England or the IMF or many, many uh, independent forecasters had predicted. Perhaps there is an underlying resilience here that we tend to underplay. So why the constant pessimism from forecasters? Partly, I think, this is a simple market issue. Uh, As a species, we are attuned, designed, if you like, to be more focused on bad news, potential dangers ahead, than on good news. And we can all understand why that might be. But it means that in the market of opinion, in the market of being noticed, if you want to be noticed, be a Cassandra. But beyond that, I think that most modern, diversified economies... With, with underlying strengths. And we in Britain have strengths, as well as the weaknesses we all know about, and the New Statesman talks about a lot, tend to have the ability to bounce back often faster than expected. Over the, the Christmas and New Year break, in some ways the most interesting political book I was reading was a new biography of Claude Monet, the French painter, which pointed out that in 1870, France was flat on its back. Monet, like many other people, had fled the country. It had been defeated by the Prussians in the Franco-Prussian War. Paris was surrounded. There was the bloody events of the Commune. And in many ways, France felt a completely defeated nation. And yet, by 1871, 1872, the country was roaring back again, uh, led by its entrepreneurs and extraordinary cultural energy. And the France that we remember, that kind of golden-tinted France of the late 19th century, was being born. Now, I don't want to push this too far, of course, but you could argue that after COVID and the inflationary effects of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, much lesser disasters in many ways, there is a potential bounce-back effect in Britain as well. If there is going to be some kind of bounce-back effect, then I think you would look to, for instance, the startup world, where Britain is already doing very well by most standards, including Startup Blink, Uh, one of the analysts, Britain is number two now in the world to place for startups, uh, number one in Europe. So look there for a sense of energy and revival. And look also to the cultural world. The cultural industries in Britain have been growing twice as fast as the economy generally. They tend to be ignored by politicians for reasons I've never totally understood. But there is a lot of energy in British filmmaking, in television production, in theatre, Um, and in design at the moment, which is well worth keeping an eye on and remembering. So what might this mean for Labour? Above all, I think it would be unwise for the party to spend the spring, quotes, talking Britain down. I just feel deep down that 2024 will be a bad year for miserabilism. Now, that's not to say, of course, that millions upon millions of people in this country are not having a really hard time and are going to have a hard time in the year ahead as well. But I think voters well understand the failures now of the last 14 years of Conservative government. They understand the reasons for the failures, the zigzags in policy, 
the, the self-interested, selfish, endless political feuds between leadership groups and all of that. I don't think you have to go on and on about it. Voters know there have been very tough times, that we are not out of the woods and that there are hard times ahead. But I think to constantly talk down Britain, in the old phrase, would be a mistake. And so I therefore think that uh, Keir Starmer's New Year message of hope was actually the right one. He didn't always sound terribly optimistic, but he said... The power of the vote, the potential for national renewal, the chance finally to turn the page, lift the weight off our shoulders, unite as a country and get our future back. I think a degree of optimism, economic optimism in particular, is very important. And it has a message for Labour in particular, which I think has not been properly spotted. Because it's clear that the argument between the parties is going to be partly of the £28 billion Labour Green Investment Fund, something that Labour is already retreating from a bit, and I would advise them to retreat from not too far. Because if the economy is improving, if interest rates are coming down this year, and they will, that means the cost of government borrowing is coming down, and that is partly where Jeremy Hunt, the Chancellor, gets his headroom for further tax cuts in a spring budget. But this cuts both ways. If the cost of borrowing is coming down, if the economy is beginning to revive, then that also gives Labour more opportunity to invest in the future of the British economy if they make it into power in the future. You can't both argue that all these economic predictions have been ridiculously pessimistic, the economy is doing very, very well, and there's room for tax cuts on the one hand, and then say there's going to be absolutely no room for Labour to spend anything on the other hand. It cuts both ways. And I think it's really important that Labour has some kind of definition. The country understands the need for economic modernisation and for the drive towards net zero perfectly well. For Labour, endless tactical retreat, shying away from the need to invest rather than trying to match endless Tory tax cuts would, I think, be a grievous error. The Labour Party needs to run towards this argument, not away from it. And they can exploit things like the fact that Chris Skidmore, perhaps the most prominent Green Conservative in Parliament, is resigning uh, in protest at the government's new measure to increase oil and gas drilling in the North Sea, undermining its role as a leader on net zero. There's lots to talk about there. Labour should not shy away from the argument about investment. It needs definition as much as the Conservatives do. But this takes me to another powerful undercurrent in Britain at the moment. Would Labour reinvestment really transform us as a country? Traditionally, pessimism was a quality of the right, a kind of world-weary view about human nature's fallen condition and the inability of the state to really improve very much. That was anchored in conservative thought, has been for hundreds of years. And, and on the other hand, progressives and optimists were almost the same thing. But this seems to be flipping, and today we seem to me to be living in an age of what I would call progressive pessimism. Take the immediate outlook. Despite the polls, Labour can't win the election. It's too much of an ask. And if they do win, they won't be able to turn the economy around again. It's too much of an ask. The economy is too weak. The country is too much on its back. It can't happen. But if Labour does turn the economy around, well, it won't be for long. The Tories will romp back in, even more right-wing than before. We're all doomed. Trump's out there. The horizon is entirely black. There is no hope. So where does this progressive pessimism come from? Well, in part, I think it is a natural reaction to the vacuous, grinning boosterism of the Johnson and Truss years, and perfectly right too. In part, I think it's a real sense, an accurate sense, of how Britain has lost heft and agency in the modern world. We are a smaller economy, we are less powerful than we used to be, and therefore we are more open to forces from outside. And those things are accurate and true. But I also think there is an underlying sense of the rotting, corrosive effect of the consumerism that is all around us, a sense that gone shopping Britain has become a spoiled, inattentive, childish culture, lacking the requisite sense of public virtue and communal empathy upon which progressive politics must rest. Now, I think this is an incredibly dangerous way of thinking because uh, an improved Britain, a revived Britain, depends on more than a better government. It depends upon an atmosphere of national optimism, 
and it depends upon people going above and beyond, doing their bit for people around them. It involves us all rolling up our sleeves and getting engaged again, and you don't get that if you are fundamentally depressed and pessimistic about your country's chances. So yes, I was pleased to hear Starmer in his New Year's speech address not people who are obsessed about politics, but those who are, in some ways, engaged in the national project. If you've spent the last 14 years volunteering to keep your park clean, your library open, for children to have opportunities, if you've been serving our country, whether in scrubs or in the uniform of your regiment, and what you want now is a politics that serves you, then make no mistake, this is your year. Labour can't really properly win and win big this year without embracing economic optimism, without taking on that argument about tax cuts versus investment in the future, um, and without defeating progressive pessimism. I don't think this is a year in which clenched, defensive, endless man-marking politics will work. The danger isn't a Tory surge. The more Rishi Sunak insists on his one-man mission of modernisation and change, the more he focuses our attention on the shattered, broken, divided party just behind him. I think the danger is a general quiet, exhausted, walking away from politics entirely in this most important electoral year, what Starmer calls the shrug of the shoulder.